Now, if we go external, we have kind of more options uh, because we don't have to look for duplication of information within our data record. Now, what we're looking for is information in our data record that may or may not be consistent with information in some external information source. So, you guys are familiar with taxonomy. Well, um, taxonomy is quite uh, fluid. Even in birds, where we have a pretty good concept of what's going on. So, for example, here is the ostrich. Okay? And in this list, which is the, this is, these are birds, this is, these are our different authority lists, in Clement's sixth edition, the ostrich is considered one species. In this newer list, it's considered two. Okay, or this albatross in the older list is considered one species, and in the newer list, it's considered three. Or to give you a different example, with Cyrenus, uh, you see it's a large, diverse genus, but notice here that a bunch of the Cyrenus taxa are moved into a different genus, Crithraga, Crithagra. Um, and so all of those sorts of things can cause us problems. And I'm going to give you an example right here, where here we have Crithagra Rikerdi, but in this taxonomy, it's split into two species, Rikerdi and Gularis. I just want to show you a real easy example of how that can cause problems in a data set. I did a VertNet search on uh, Rikerdi, and notice that I get two different names associated with that. One is I get Rikerdi as a full species, and the other is I get it as a subspecies of Gularis. Okay? And it's basically that one data source is following one taxonomy and a different data source is following a different taxonomy. But I may well then find a single site that has both of these alleged species present. And that's actually not true. We're talking about one biological entity. So that's one sort of, or one example of using external sources to evaluate consistency in a data set. What we might do is take our list of taxa and match it up against one of those authority lists. Okay? And that way we don't end up repeating a species. And so the whole idea of authority lists becomes very important. In the vertebrates, we have a lot of luxury, okay? We have these nice authority lists. This is something that's curated by a bunch of uh, very knowledgeable ornithologists, and you can download the uh, International Ornithological Commission's uh, World Bird List. It's given stable versions that you can cite. It's a lot of positive things about this. Is there such a list for you know, the reduvids of the world? No. Is there such a thing for the plants of any of your countries? Maybe. Okay. But those authority lists are rare and they're really, really important. Okay. So again, this is a luxury of the vertebrate world. So another type of external consistency that we can talk about is consistency with other records of the species, okay? And this is one of the most important things about sharing data. This is a super, super example of why, not at the end of the day, but at the beginning of the day, we should be sharing data. Because we can then see the data set that we're interested in, in the context of lots of other data sets. I'll give you some examples. Here is a, a swallow, uh, and that's a decent description of its true geographic distribution. Um, and you can see it's, it's kind of 
halfway down the African continent. We can go to one data source, and this is VertNet, and we can see a map of a bunch of occurrences of it. And if you look, that generally fits with this portion of its distribution. Okay? But we can go to another data source, and we see records down here, far away from the known geographic distribution of that species. That doesn't mean they're wrong. Maybe this is wrong. You have to doubt everything. Maybe this is the problem, or maybe these are problem records. We have to think about both possibilities. And certainly, if we're worried about consistency, if we want good, clean data, we need to look at those two records very, very carefully. Here's another example of looking for consistency with other records. This is the group that I did my dissertation on, or the PhD. It's called a scrub jay. Uh, it's a corvid, so a relative of your crows. But it has a disjunct species in Florida, and then it has species throughout Western North America. They come down in Mexico, and they stop at the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. Okay? Right away, I'm picking out some geographic problems, but I'm not going to tell you about them right, right now. Okay? Uh, rather, what I did was I put those records, I linked them to um, temperature. And so each one of these I put on top of a climate surface, and I extracted the value of temperature, and then I made a distribution of the temperature values associated with those points. And all I want you to do is look at those. They're outliers, okay? And this one actually is an error. Sorry, it is this record. And that species definitely, definitely does not go down to the coast of, of Oaxaca. That's Puerto Escondido there. I've been there. The J is definitely not there. I know that's an error. And it shows up not just because I know the geography, but also because I can see it in this histogram of, of uh, temperature values. Okay? So we can look at, I'll give you another example later, we can look at our occurrence data in environmental space. And we can say, okay, what are the weird values? Maybe they're just the extremes of the distribution of the species with respect to that environmental dimension. Or maybe they're errors. Both are possible. And then finally, I'll give you kind of a fun example. Uh, we can look at consistency with other records uh, from the collector. Now, this is a project that I've been working on with a couple of colleagues for 24 years now. Uh, it's essentially a complete compilation of all bird specimen records from Mexico. And we have like 400,000 bird records, bird specimen records from Mexico. Um, and it gives us quite a bit of, of analytical power because you can, for example, say, I want to see all of the specimens that Thelina collected in Mexico. Okay, right now that's none. But there are other collectors where they collected 30, 40,000 specimens in the course of 20, 30, 40 years. Um, so we did this analysis, which was, I thought, quite a bit of fun. Essentially what we did was we compiled itineraries of collectors by their specimens. So we took all the specimens that a particular person collected in his lifetime, and we put them in order by day, by day through his lifetime. And a very good collector will go to a place and maybe collect 100 specimens, then get in the truck and drive to another place and collect 100 specimens there, and get in the truck again and drive to another place and collect there. So you can imagine a positive geographic pattern in this respect will be boom, 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 boom. And maybe three days later, boom, 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 right? 
Well, let's see what happens. So what we did was, again, we put collector's records in order by day, and from every consecutive specimen to every other consecutive specimen, in that order, we calculated the geographic distance from one point to the next. Okay, that's a, uh, the distance on the surface of a sphere, so we were being very careful. And then we said, okay, we'll give the collector um, 40 kilometers as a maximum movement radius within a day. And 100 kilometers if it's one day to the next and 200 kilometers in two days and 500 kilometers in three days. Now that obviously changes through time. So we could, we could fine tune this. You know, these days there are very good highways in Mexico and 120 years ago everything was done on horseback. Okay, so this is just the example. But I'll give you one very clear example. This man, Alan R. Phillips, whom you will see later on as our as our star uh, in data corruption. In 1955, between the 2nd and 10th of October, he starts collecting on the 2nd, up here. And then three days later, he's down here. So he has three days to travel this distance. That's probably reasonable. There are good roads along the coast. And then the fifth, he collects here and here. The sixth, he collects here. Seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth. Okay? So either he had an airplane stashed somewhere, or there's something wrong with this. Notice, actually, on the same day, he was collecting in both places. Okay, so that's a problem. And we can look at essentially any collector and we can put different distance and time filters on his or her itinerary and we can ask whether there are outliers like this. So we, we took um, four very prolific historical collectors and then we also took my co-author, uh, good friend and, and uh, colleague over the years. And what you can see is that even my colleague, who's a very, very careful manager of his data, we found several potential errors. And one of them, we actually figured out what the problem was. It was a, a roadkill that he picked up as he was traveling. And the, somebody made a, a typographical error and the number of degrees in the longitude was off by two degrees. And so by looking at his itinerary, you know, one of these signaled potential problems, we actually fixed a georeference in the data set from his museum. Now, these other guys, much more specimens. Notice uh, Chester Lamb, 34,000 specimens collected in his lifetime. And out of those, we're kind of talking about 2%.